Let's try this now. Okay, take two. <laughs> Linear functions and slope. Like I said, slope is the... Yay, it showed this time. Okay, is the slope of the line through the different points. It's the change in the y's over the change in the x's. You called that the letter M for forever. We're still doing all of that. In Algebra 1, you called it the rise over the run. That is still what it is. But I'm going to adjust this for me. I like saying rise over the right. Okay, because when we're doing the run, we're always moving to the right of the graph when you're counting slopes. So that's helpful not to accidentally count backwards. Rise over run or rise over right. It's the change in the y's over the changes in the x's. Y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. If you're going to highlight any particular thing here that would be helpful, I would say it's this version of slope. M equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. But it's really just figuring out the direction, the steepness of that line. Um, here's a fun fact. If you didn't know or never questioned why they use M for slope when slope doesn't have the letter M in it, it's because it's actually from the French verb monter. I don't speak French. So that's probably wrong pronunciation, which means to rise or to ascend. So that totally makes sense to us. Let's just practice using slope again. Throwing it back to like algebra one, if we're finding the slope between these two points, uh, you probably labeled x1, y1, x2, y2. We can still do that. So that when we're plugging it into our slope equation, we would do y2 minus y1. Yes, I know I put minus a minus, just hold on for a second. x2 minus x1. Because I wanted to emphasize that this formula has a subtraction sign in it, I didn't want to change that to a plus right away. But we know that minus a minus is what? Positive. So just to show my work here so that later when you're looking at your notes that makes sense to you, minus a minus is plus. This is going to end up being, why did I write a 5? Oh, because I added those numbers in my head already. <laughs> this is going to be 5 over 1, which means the slope between those two points is 5. Does that sound familiar to us? Mm -hmm. All right, let's try it one more time. So you're gonna tell me what to fill in. I'm not even gonna label the points. Let's see if we can do it without labeling. What should I write on top? Negative two minus four, and on bottom? Two minus, two minus negative three, which this time, yeah, we can shorthand to three. We already have it down once in our notes. Minus a minus is plus. That ends up being negative six on top and five on bottom. If that doesn't reduce down, we're done. This means we're going down six and to the right five for our slope of this line. Bless you. So we found the slope, easy peasy, right? Amazing, it describes the way that graph moves. So this one would go up five to the right one. That one would go down six to the right five every time you found a nice pretty coordinate point. So we could eventually play connect the dots. Now. Adding on a little bit, if we wanted to start writing equations of a line, y'all remember point-slope form. Point-slope form of an equation requires a point and a slope to write. It is the most basic of any linear equations we can write because all we need, again, is a point and a slope. The points are filled in where x1 and y1 are, and then the slope goes where the m goes. So if we have an example like number two and it asks us to write an equation for a line in point slope form with a slope of four that passes through this coordinate point, we have all the information we need. We would fill in y minus y1. What is y1? Three equal to m, which is four, times x minus x1. What's x1? So minus and minus means that's plus. Boom, right there. That is an equation of a line. It is written in point slope form. If the question asks you to stop at point slope form, we would be done. But what does this question also ask for us to do? <laughs> Solve the equation for y. So it's a two step. We're gonna distribute, which means this is four x plus four. And then we're just gonna simply move that three to the other side and combine it with its like term, which means this will be y equal to 4x plus 7 as a little preview. Does anyone remember what that equation is called? Intercept form. Slope intercept form, yeah. Ding, ding, ding. We got it. Okay, the only way this can be made harder is if it's exa like example three and it says write an equation in point slope form for the line passing through two points. Did it tell you the slope? No. What did it give you though? 
two points. Given two points, what can we find anyways? Yeah, we can still find the slope. We can still find the rise over run using the formula from above. So if I was filling this out, what should I write down? Yeah, 6 plus 3 over negative 2 minus 4, which is 9 over negative 6. If I reduce that down, it's negative 3 over 2. Just simplifying that fraction. So now I have a slope and I have a point. It does not matter which of the two points that you use. Out of habit, I always use the one that is listed first. So if we were filling this into point slope form, it would be y minus negative 3 equal to negative 3 over 2 times x minus 4. Are we okay with the minus and minus becoming plus? Okay, thank you. I agree. Now, this would be point slope form. If that's all it wanted, we'd stop there, but it does say to solve for y or write it in slope intercept form. So we do distribute. Oh my gosh, distributing a fraction. Do not panic. A fraction times a letter is just the fraction and a letter stuck next to each other. Multiplying a fraction times a constant means you just multiply it on top. What is negative 3 times negative 4? Positive 12, and then divide by 2. What is? So that's positive 6. Again, if for doing that in your head, you do numerator times numerator. So negative 3 times negative 4, which is positive 12, divide by the number you're dividing in the fraction. So that's 6. Last step is we just quickly subtract 3 from both sides, but it's just going to subtract with that nice whole number. So we have negative 3 over 2x plus 3. Using slope so far, how we feeling? Feeling like things we remember? Great. Here's some more things you might remember. On the back page, you already nailed this one. We have slope intercept form. Slope intercept form is the y equals version, the most common probably seen version of a linear equation. The slope times the variable plus the y intercept. It is really easy to use to graph functions in slope intercept form. And so let's just remind ourselves how we do that. If we have this equation y equals to negative 3 over 2x plus 2, what is the slope? The m. Uh -huh, the m. So what number is there? three over two and what is your y-intercept two now again your y-intercept tells you exactly where the graph is going to cross the y-axis so I can just plop over here to the graph and put a dot on the y-axis at two that gives me my beginning point B for beginning point and then the M tells me how I'm going to move now this is where it becomes really handy to remember I say rise over right because we're always gonna want to move to the right for that bottom number the rise might be a fall, though. So since this is a negative number, I'm going to fall three units, one, two, three, and then I'm going to go to the right, two. And I'm going to keep doing that pattern until I have a bunch of coordinate points and I feel confident that I can play connect the dots without messing up, which me personally means I'm making lots of dots because I don't draw very good straight lines. Once you have enough dots to feel like you can draw a straight line, you play connect the dots, and voila you have your nice, perfectly graphed, hopefully, slope-intercept form linear equation. Now, when it comes to horizontal and vertical lines, these are really simple, but students get mistaken for these a lot. So I think in Algebra 1, I don't if you took Algebra 1 here, you learned some acronyms. They're called HOI and VUX. Does that sound familiar to you? Hoy and Vux, if it doesn't, here's what they mean. Hoy and Vux stands for horizontal lines have a slope of zero, and they start with Y. They cross the Y axis. Vertical lines have an undefined slope, and they start with X equals, and they cross the X axis. So if we look at these equations right here that we have, we have a horizontal equation that crosses the Y axis. That's because that is our Hoy equation. The slope is zero and the equation is y equal to some number. That number happens to be the y-intercept, slope of zero. Our vux line that's right here next to it is this vertical line. Its slope is undefined and its equation is x equal to some number. Again, that's vux. 
So we don't need to work too exactly hard when it comes to these simpler equations that are horizontal or vertical. We just need to remember which one's which. And that's what Hoivux is really helpful for. So on this one rectangular coordinate system, I want us to graph both the equation y equal to negative 4 and x equal to 2. I highlighted them on purpose this way. Since this equation that I highlighted in pink is y equals, that means that this one is going to be a horizontal line with a slope of 0 that crosses the y-axis at negative 4. So I have to plop down there at negative 4 and then just follow the grid lines, which somehow still is kind of hard for me, and make a beautiful horizontal line. Since this equation up in blue starts with x equals, I know that that's going to be a vertical line. And my vertical line is going to cross the x-axis directly at 2. And then again, I can just follow the nice grid lines. I don't have to follow a rise and a run since it's an undefined slope. It's straight up and down. Graphing the horizontal and the vertical lines, not too crazy. So, so far, we've had a lot of formulas floating around. We had the slope formula. We had point slope equation of a line. We had slope intercept equation of a line. We have Hoivux equations. And last but not least, we have the general form of the equation of a line. What are some things you notice about this general form of an equation? It equals zero. We have to get all of the stuff of the equation, the pieces of the equation, the x's, the y's, and the constant on one side of the equation, and make sure two things. We have to make sure, number one, that a is a positive number. So a must be positive. Why am I struggling spelling it positive? OK. And then typically, a and b cannot be fractions. So you'd have to get rid of the fractions if they were fractions. Multiply by the LCD. Okay, general form is helpful when you're finding intercepts or it's a lot of times where you're starting off a problem, um, but it's not one that you used all that much in other classes. So in example six, we're going to find the slope and the y-intercept of the line whose equation is in general form is 3x plus 2y minus 4 equals 0. Well, not a big deal because all I need to do to find the slope and the y-intercept is solve for y. In two steps, I'm going to subtract the 3x and add the 4 to the other side. So move the 3x with subtraction, move the negative 4 with addition. I'm one step away for solving for y. What is it? Divided by 2. And I make sure I do that to every single term here so that the whole equation is divided by 2. This would be negative 3 over 2x plus 2 which means that the slope is what? Negative 3 over 2, and your y-intercept is 2. Okay, go to lunch. I just couldn't help myself but finish that problem. So right before lunch bell went off, I like quickly finished this one, but let's back up and make sure we actually understand why. Yeah, so the first step, I subtracted 3x and added 4 to start to isolate the y divided by 2, and the reason I want to isolate the y is because the number next to x is your slope, and the number by itself is your y-intercept. So since this question asked me to find the slope and the y-intercept, there we go. We have the slope and we have the y-intercept. Any questions on that one? Fabulous. Moving on. Next page, we're already on section 2.4. Like I said, this these kind of sections are a little bit of a review <clears throat> they go on to more about slope, and this is where we might get into some stuff that's a little different. Still some topics from Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 that will sound familiar. Let's talk about parallel and perpendicular lines. So for parallel lines, parallel lines, you can think about pairs of L's. That is the symbol for parallel lines, is two parallel lines, right? If they are parallel, important detail right here, that means that they have the same slope. 
Whatever the slope of one line is, the slope of the other line is the same. You can use that idea backwards to prove that the two things are parallel, which is to show they have the same slope. So it's two distinct vertical lines, both with undefined slopes, are parallel. On the other hand, perpendicular lines are like the crossroads at an intersection. And so the symbol for perpendicular lines looks like this. Perpendicular lines or the slope of perpendicular lines, when you multiply them together, their product is negative one. But the thing that you probably learned in previous classes is that these slopes are opposite or negative reciprocals of the, of the other. Oh, I just stuttered really hard. So if the, we can think about that backwards. If the product of the two lines is negative one, oops, missed a whole number right here. Let's insert the number negative one. Then the lines are perpendicular. A horizontal line having zero slope is perpendicular to a vertical line having undefined slope. They meet at a right angle. Their slopes, when you multiply them, create negative one. Okay, so let's jump right in. Let's write the equation of a line parallel to another given line using the stuff that we learned from 2.3. So we're writing an equation of a line that passes through this coordinate point and is parallel to this line. To write an equation in point slope, we need a slope and we need a point. Did they give us a point? Yes. yes. Did they give us a slope? Technically, yes, because if they told us it's parallel to this line, we know the slope that we want to use is the same exact slope that was in the given equation. So we have a slope, we have a point, we can write our point slope equation. Y minus Y1 equal to M times X minus X1. Just like we did in the first section. It does want me to write it in point slope form, which I have done, and slope intercept form, which is the Y equals version. So we will distribute. This becomes 2X plus 6. Drop this down. Add one to both sides. So we have both the point slope form and the slope intercept form of the equation that is parallel to that line and goes through the point negative three comma one. If however, like in example two, this time they say it passes through a particular point and is perpendicular to a line, we have to do a little bit of work, especially because that line is written in general form. And in fact, we're going to write our answer in general form. So we have the point. We need the slope. To find the slope, we solve the general form equation for y. So I would subtract x and add 8 to the other side. Divide everything by 4. So negative 1x divided by 4 is negative 1 fourth x. And 8 divided by 4 is 2. What's the slope of the given line? Negative 1 fourth. But the information I want from that is I want the parallel slope to that. If the given line is negative 1 fourth, what's the slope that I want to use? Positive 4. You flip the fraction, change the sign. Now I have a point, and now I have my slope. We can go to point slope form, which is y minus y1 equal to m times x minus x1. We distribute that 4, 4x four minus 12. And then we remember for a second, we are not solving for y. We're writing this in general form, which means we want all of the letters and the constant on the same side, and it's set equal to 0. My recommendation is to always go towards the x, wherever the x is, because we need the a value, which is a number in front of x, to be positive. So if you go towards the x, that means we're subtracting y and we're subtracting 5 that direction we'll end up with 4x minus y minus 17 being equal to 0. If you had taken everything towards the y, you would have ended up with a negative a value and had to divide by negative 1, and it's just like extra steps that are unnecessary. So we're going to go towards the x to keep the x thing positive, the coefficient of x positive.
So again, this one was only different from before. We had to find the correct slope to use. And when we were solving, we wrote in general form instead of slope intercept form. And that's the basics with slope. When we start to get a little bit more advanced with slope, we start to call it the rate of change of the function. And it describes a little bit more about the situation and can be applied to functions that are not necessarily linear. So slope is still defined as the ratio of a change in y to a corresponding change in x. It describes how fast y is changing with respect to x. So our slope is this rate of change, but we don't necessarily have just rates of change for linear functions. We can find rates of changes for situations with context and situations that are not linear. So in example three here, it says the line graphs for the living arrangements of young adults are shown again in the figure on the right. I don't know why the word again is there. Find the slope of the line segment for the percentage of young adults ages 25 to 34, which is the entire, that's what the graph is showing us, uh, of owning a home and describe what the slope represents. So for context here, it gives you two things and we're looking for the people who own a home. So we're looking at this top graph. Okay, the bottom graph means that that is the living arrangements of people who live with their parents from the age of 25 to 34. Let's figure out the slope of that line. The slope means I just need to find the change in the outputs over the change in the inputs. So if I was finding the slope here, I would use the two coordinates from the, the graph itself. I would be doing 34.4 minus 45.4 over the inputs of 2017 over minus 2000. Do you see how that's still the formula for slope? I've just used these coordinate points to gather that information. If you trust me, we would calculate this becomes negative seven over 17, which is approximately equal to negative 0.41. So what does that mean? Because that's the slope, down 7 over 17. What that means in words is that the percentage of US young adults who own their home own their own, sure, home has decreased by approximately 41.41 each year. It no, not again. Let's see if I can get it to unfreeze, but it's decreased because it's a negative slope by approximately that number. Okay, it's back up. So 0.41 or 41% each year. So again, we can use the word decreased to show that the slope is going down. So we don't have to say decreased by negative 0.41. You're already telling me it's going down by saying the word decreased. But we have interpreted what this rate of change or what the slope means for the information given in the table. The last extension of slope that we have today to work on is called the average rate of change of a function. Now this is where we can start applying the ideas of slopes to functions that are not linear. So if you took pre -cal, AP pre-cal last year, you've used this formula a lot, so it should look familiar to you hopefully. But if the function is not linear, it doesn't have a constant slope but we can still find what's called the average rate of change of a function using this formula right here. It literally is the slope function, just made fancier with function notation. So f of x2 does mean y2. f of x1 does mean y1. So we're still putting the outputs on the top and the inputs on the bottom, exactly like we did with slope. Since we're just applying this to more than just a straight line though, we're not finding the slope anymore, we're finding the average rate of change between those two points. 
So I've, I've got an example here and it's already fully worked out so you can kind of see what's happening here. We have a man's height over time. So like here he is as a wee child and then they grow up. Yeah, you, you're doing this right now, you're growing up. If we, I was wanting to know uh, at age 13, from 13 to 18, was the average rate of change of this person's growth? Well, it's not linear because like you can see in this graph, they like had a growth spurt right here. And then like we're still growing, but like not as quickly. But we want to know between these two points, what would be the average rate of change if you looked when the kid was 13 and you looked when the kid was 18? So we find the average rate of change or the slope of the secant line connecting those two points together. That's average rate of change. So see here, I do f of 18 minus f of 13. That's this. Over 18 minus 13, these should be the same numbers. I'm getting 76 from the fact that at age 18, how tall was the dude? Yeah, 76 inches, yeah. And at age 13, how old was the guy? I mean old, tall, oh my gosh, <laughs> 57. So I'm just reading the table, reading the graph, reading the equation to get the outputs, plugging it into my formula, beep, beep, bop, computing, and I have the average rate of change of this guy. The man's average rate of change, or average growth rate, from age 13 to 18 was 3.8 inches per year. Obviously, he grew a lot at the beginning and a little less at the end, but over time, on average, between those two points, we just use the outputs at those two points. This is not the slope of the function itself, but it's the slope between the two points I'm caring about. That's what we're working with with average rate of change. Can we do an example that's like simpler, no context? Back page here, I just have our cute little parabola, our quadratic, quadratic parent function. We're gonna find the average rate of change for this function f of x squared from these different intervals. We'll do the first one together and then I'll let you guys try the other two just to make sure we know how to plug all the stuff in, yeah? If we're finding the average rate of change for number one between the input values of zero and one, we would do the following. We would say we're finding the average rate of change between f of one minus f of zero over one minus zero. Let's talk about where everything came from. Where did these zeros come from? Yeah, x1. That's the first part, that's where I'm starting to look. Where did the one come from? Cool, now let's find these values. So let's read the graph. At an input value of one, what is my output value? One, so f of one is one. What is f of zero? Zero. So I have one minus zero over one minus zero, which is one over one, or one. Now, what in the world did we just find? I'm so glad you asked, thank you. We're finding the slope of the line that would connect these two points if we were drawing straight lines between them. So if we looked at the graph and played connect the dots between f of zero and f of one, do you agree that that line right there has a rise of one and a run of one? We have found the slope of the secant line. That's the average rate of change of this quadratic function between zero and one. So you can always double check on a graph to make sure it makes sense. Do y'all wanna try one on your own or do you wanna see another? And this, yeah. no functional difference, like they're literally the same thing, it's just that notation-wise, you'll only use y's when it's a linear function, you'll use f of x's. It's like yeah, it's literally the same thing. This one's like fancier though, right? Oh. And it applies to more situations. Slope applies to linear functions, average rate of change applies to all of functions. Okay. Let's have you guys try b and c, and then double check your work with the, t with the graph, because you can always count rises and runs for these two coordinate points, but I wanna see what you got. How'd we do? So hopefully this, kind of, we're really just finding slopes. We're just finding slopes on curved functions, which means we're finding average rates of change. But if you have a nice pretty grid like we do, we can still count the rise and the run between the points that we have. Are there any questions before we go on? I heard good questions at this table. Are we okay? Yeah. 
Okay, so average rate of change allows us to take, again, the concept of change over time and apply it to functions that are not linear. Um, for example, let's try this one. When a person receives a drug ingested into a muscle, the concentration of the drug in the body measured in milligrams per 100 milliliters is a function of the time elapsed after the injection measured in hours. The figure on the right shows the graph of such a function where X represents hours after the injection and F of X is the drug's concentration at time X. Find the average rate of change in the, drug, in the drug's concentration between three and seven hours. So if we think about this, like if you get like a vitamin B shot or something because you're feeling sick, it just like floods your system with vitamin B and then slowly goes away. This makes sense to us, but we want to find the average rate of change in the drug's concentration between hour three and hour seven. So we set up our formula as such. We would say the average rate of change, a rock, for this function between three and seven hours, we would do F of seven minus f of 3 all over 7 minus 3. Now again, we're reading a graph here. So what is f of 7? 0 0.02. What is f of 3? And all of that is going to be over 7 minus 3, which is 4. I think you trust me to have put this in my calculator. I trust you to do it later. You calculate beep, 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 bop, you'd get negative 0.03 over 4, which is approximately equal to, or equal to 0 0.0075, negative. Now, first of all, does this make sense? If we were playing connect the dots here between these two points, should we have a negative slope? Yes, yes that makes sense to us. We could also count here if it goes down and over the right amount. So there's always checks in place for these average rates of change. But let's translate this into words. What does this even mean? That the concentration of the drug in the bloodstream is going to be decreasing at a rate of 0 0.0075 milligrams per 100 milliliters per hour. Ooh, units. Again, decreasing takes care of the fact that it's a negative slope. This con drug concentration is decreasing at a rate of 0 0.0075 milligrams per 100 milliliters per hour. Now, the reason we even study slope and rate of change and the reason that we did that crazy difference quotient last class is for this reason right here. And this is really leading us into calculus if anybody ever actually takes like calculus, calculus. Suppose we're interested in finding the average rate of change in F from some value to some that value plus like a little bitty more. So like if this is one, this is 1.0001, just like a little bit more. In this case, the average rate of change, if we filled that in, would be f of x plus h minus f of x over x plus h minus x. And oh my gosh, once you cancel out those x's, what does this look like? Does anybody recognize this from last class? Remember that last example last class where we had all of that distribution all at once? This is the difference quotient again. The difference quotient gives us the average rate of a change of a function from x to x plus h, which in calculus will allow us to find what's called the instantaneous rate of change when you add the concepts of limits to this, which is really pretty cool. So this idea of the difference quotient partnered with the idea of average rate of change, as long as you pick a very small h value, will give us close to the instantaneous rate of change without having to do actual calculus which is pretty cool. That's just a fun fact for you. I showed you why we did all of that last class. How do we feel about slope? Good, we should. It's pretty straightforward from things we've learned in previous courses.